Hello my dear friends. Now as a part of the continuation of the ECG series, let me discuss now the very important topic that is the cardiac arrhythmias. So in this session I will be just giving you a basic introduction of the cardiac arrhythmias like what are the various types of cardiac arrhythmias and what are the mechanisms for the cardiac arrhythmias. So in this session it will be just a basic introduction. Now first of all you should know what exactly is the definition of the cardiac arrhythmias. So please remember the cardiac arrhythmia, the word arrhythmia that means it is an irregular heartbeat and that particular irregular heartbeat it can be a faster irregular heartbeat or it can be a slower irregular heartbeat. But the word arrhythmia it stands for what is called as the irregular heartbeat and in this particular cardiac arrhythmias we have two important terminologies that is tachycardia and as well as the bradycardia. So tachyarrhythmias means it is an irregular heartbeat with faster heart rate. Bradyarrhythmias it is an irregular heartbeat with slower heart rate that is called as the bradyarrhythmias. Now this entire cardiac arrhythmias we classify that into four main types. Now what are those four main types of the cardiac arrhythmias? They include the extra beat right and what is that particular extra beat it could be of the atrial origin which is called atrial premature contracture or it could be ventricular origin which is called the ventricular premature contracture that is what is your extra beat and the other type of the arrhythmias is the supraventricular tachycardia that means the origin of this abnormal impulse is above the ventricle that is within the atria and they constitute what is called as the supraventricular tachycardia. And the third important thing is the ventricular arrhythmias. Here the abnormal impulses they originate within the ventricle. So it includes your ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia. And bradyarrhythmias. So if you take this bradyarrhythmias in this particular clinical scenario there will be an abnormal heart rate or there will be an abnormal rhythm but it will be a slow abnormal rhythm that is what is called as the bradyarrhythmia. Now let me discuss about this particular extra beats first. So if you take this extra beat as I have already said you the extra beat could be either from atria or the extra beat could be from the ventricle. So if the extra beat is from the atria that is called premature atrial contractures and if the extra beat is from the ventricle then it is called premature ventricular contractions. So this is what is called as the extra beat, premature atrial contractions and premature ventricular contractions. So that is what is called as the extra beat. Now actually before going on to the discussion of the cardiac arrhythmias, you should know the basic conducting system of the heart. So if you take the basic conducting system of the heart, it has the following components. So consider this is your four chambered heart, we have the SA node, then we have the AV node and in between the SA node and AV node we have the internodal fibers right and then followed by that we have bundle of his right we have bundle of his and from the bundle of his we have right bundle branch and as well as the left bundle branch. So this is what is the basic conducting system of the heart and out of which the SA node this is considered as the pacemaker of the heart. So the impulses should originate from the SA node and later on the impulses will move through the internodal fibers and through the internodal fibers the impulses will just pass on to the AV node and from the AV node the impulses move to the bundle of his and then to the right bundle branch and as well as to the left bundle branch right next to the left bundle branch. So this is the basic conducting system of the heart and the impulse has to originate from the AC node in order to have a sinus rhythm. But if the impulses are originating away or apart 
from your conducting system of the heart, then the individual will have the abnormal rhythm within the ECG. Like for example, like we were discussing about the extra beat. In case of extra beat, the abnormal impulse will originate anywhere within the atria apart from the SA node and that will give rise to what is called the premature atrial contractures. Whereas in premature ventricular contractures, this particular abnormal rhythm will originate anywhere within the ventricle and that will give rise to what is called the premature ventricular contractures. So these are your extra beats. Then followed by that we have the supraventricular arrhythmias. As already I have said you that the origin of the impulse, abnormal impulse is above the ventricle. And what are the examples of your supraventricular arrhythmias? That includes atrial fibrillation, right? Where the atrial rate will be nearly around 400 to 500 per minute and atrial flutter. So in atrial flutter, the atrial rate, right? It will be nearly around 200 to 300 per minute. And then we have paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. And we have one more type of the supraventricular tachycardia that is supraventricular tachycardia with aberrancy. SVT with aberrancy. Right? So this is what is your supraventricular tachycardia. So examples are atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia and as well as SVT with aberrancy. Then followed by that, the other type of arrhythmias, what we have discussed is the ventricular arrhythmias. So ventricular arrhythmias, like we have two forms the, or we have two types, ventricular fibrillation and as well as ventricular tachycardia. And in case of ventricular fibrillation, and it is always the DC shock as the first line treatment. But whereas ventricular tachycardia, if it is a stable VT, right, the drug of choice will be lignocaine. But if it is an unstable VT, where the individual is hemodynamically unstable, then the first line management will be DC shock. So this is about your the ventricular arrhythmias. Then we have the brady arrhythmias. So if you take the brady arrhythmias, the word brady means the heart rate is reduced. So if you take the normal heart rate, it is around 60 to 100 per minute. And if it is less than 60, we use the word called bradycardia. You take sinus bradycardia. Sinus bradycardia means the rhythm will be sinus rhythm, but the heart rate will be less than 60 per minute in case of sinus bradycardia. And the other forms of the brady arrhythmias include sinus pause and sinus arrest, and then we have the sinoatrial exit block. So these are the forms of the brady arrhythmias. So this is the basic introduction to your arrhythmias, like classification of the arrhythmias, extra beats, supraventricular arrhythmias, ventricular arrhythmias, and then the brady arrhythmias. Now, if you see the mechanisms of the arrhythmias, see, the question can be asked in the following manner. What is the most common mechanism for the development of arrhythmia? Re-entry phenomenon, abnormal automaticity, triggered activity early after depolarization, triggered activity delayed after depolarization. So, first of all, let me tell you what are all the various mechanisms, then I'll give you the answer to this particular question. So, the various mechanisms for the development of the arrhythmias, they include mainly three. Number one, increased automaticity. See, the SA nodal cells, particularly, they have the cells with a particular feature called automaticity. Automaticity in the sense, it does not require any particular external stimulus for getting triggered. The cells upon themselves, they can trigger an activity or they can stimulate the entire heart. That is what is called as automaticity. And remember, all the cells in your heart has this particular property of the automaticity. But the velocity of the conduction of the automatic impulse, which is originating from SA node, is very high compared to that of the velocity of the conduction of the automatic impulses which are originating from the other cells of the heart. 
So that is the reason why the SA node is considered as the pacemaker. The SA nodal cells will have a self-triggering activity and the velocity of the conduction of impulse is also very high. So that is the reason why the SA nodal cells will be acting as a pacemaker and it will suppress the automaticity of all other cells whichever are giving a triggered automatic activity. So if that particular automaticity is increased in the SA node or any particular cell within the heart that is what is called as the increased automaticity right so you can see this so the pink color line is the normal automaticity but whereas if you see this blue color line so this tells you that there is increased automaticity okay so the, one of the mechanism for the development of arrhythmia is your increased automaticity then followed by that the next important mechanism for the development of the arrhythmia is the triggered activity so triggered activity is the second important mechanism and this particular trigger triggered activity it is usually either in the early after depolarization or delayed after depolarization so what is happening here the cell will undergo depolarization and during repolarization there will be one more impulse during the phase of repolarization so which is called as the early after depolarization if the triggered activity if it is appearing in the early phase after depolarization but if the triggered activity if it is appearing after a delayed time of depolarization that is called as delayed after depolarization so these are the triggered activity that is the second mechanism for the development of your arrhythmias and the third important mechanism is the re-entry so if you take this particular re-entry mechanism let me tell you this particular re-entry mechanism for the development of arrhythmia this is the most common mechanism for the development of arrhythmia now if you take this re-entry let me tell you the re-entry will usually occur around the AV node or the re-entry will occur between atria and as well as ventricle. Right between atria and as well as ventricle. Now, so if you take this AV node, we have a slow pathway within the AV node. Right, then we have faster pathway or fast pathway within the AV node. So you take the impulse which is going to the ventricle. It will be mainly through the fast pathway. So mainly through the fast pathway, the impulse will reach the ventricle. Right, mainly through the fast pathway, the impulse will reach the ventricle. So now, if you see this, what will happen normally, I'll tell you, and then what will happen in the re-entry mechanism for the development of arrhythmia, I will tell you. You take the slow pathway. The impulse reaches the AV node and it will be reaching to the ventricle very slowly. By the time the slow pathway enters to the distal part of the AV node, Right by the time the slow pathway reaches to the distal part of the AV node, by the time the fast pathway is transmitted into the ventricle. So always remember the ventricle will get stimulated through the fast pathway of your AV node. And the slow pathway it becomes dead. Whereas what happens in re-entry phenomenon? <clears throat> in re-entry phenomenon, there will be a block within the fast pathway, right? There will be a block within the fast pathway. So thereby what will happen? The slow pathway, it will be slowly reaching to the ventricle and slow pathway will not only enter into the ventricle, it will also move back 
even into the fast pathway as well right even it moves into the fast pathway as well because the fast pathway is being blocked and what is the etiology for the blockade of your fast pathway you have multiple reasons which we will discuss so once this particular fast pathway is blocked the slow pathway will take over the fast pathway right slow pathway will take over the fast pathway this particular slow pathway will be circulating around the av node and that is what is called as re-entry mechanism right so i'll repeat for one more time you take in a normal individual we have a slow pathway and as well as fast pathway in the av node and the impulse which is reaching to the ventricle is mainly through the fast pathway the slow pathway by the time it reaches to the distal part of the av node by the time the fast pathway it will enter into the ventricle and ventricle will have a normal trigger that is what is a normal phenomenon but whereas in case of re-entry phenomenon or in case of re-entry mechanism the fast pathway is blocked so thereby the ventricle will receive the impulse through the slow pathway and but this particular slow pathway will not only give the impulse to the ventricle it will also give the impulse to the fast pathway as well that means because the fast pathway is blocked the fast pathway will be taken over by the slow pathway around the entire av node it is your slow pathway itself whenever there is block within the fast pathway so your slow pathway will be having a re-entry mechanism around the av node and whenever there is a re-entry towards the ventricle there will be an abnormal impulses which is going to the ventricle and that will result in what is called tachycardia so these are the mechanisms for the development of your arrhythmias one is increased automaticity second one is triggered activity and the third one is the re-entry mechanism what is the most common mechanism for the development of the arrhythmia that is your re-entry now see one classification of arrhythmias is like extra bit supraventricular arrhythmias ventricular arrhythmias and then brady arrhythmias and the other way of classification of the arrhythmias is based on the duration of the qrs complex right based on the duration of the qrs complex you see a classification here which among the following has wide qrs tachycardia av nodal reentrant tachycardia pre excitation syndrome sinus node reentrant tachycardia the atrial flutter the answer to this particular question is the pre excitation syndrome but let me discuss the classification of tachycardia based on the duration of the qrs complex right so this is the classification of the tachycardia based on the qrs complex we have narrow qrs complex and we have the wide qrs complex if you take the narrow qrs complex we again classify that into av node dependent and av node independent type of the narrow qrs complex tachycardia you take av node dependent we classify this into av nodal reentrant tachycardia and atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia av nrt and av rt that is your av node dependent whereas if you take the av node independent av node independent form of narrow qrs complex tachycardia includes sinus tachycardia atrial fibrillation atrial flutter atrial tachycardia sinus node reentrant tachycardia and inappropriate sinus tachycardia so these are all av node independent forms of the narrow qrs complex tachycardia and if you take the wide qrs complex tachycardia wide qrs complex tachycardia the qrs complex the duration will be more than 120 milliseconds right the du duration of the qrs complex will be more than 120 milliseconds and what are the various forms of wide qrs complex tachycardia that includes ventricular tachycardia then the pre excitation tachycardia then the svt with aberrancy now this pre excitation tachycardia this is what is nothing but your pre excitation syndromes 
right? This is what is nothing but your pre-excitation syndromes. And these pre-excitation syndromes, mainly your WPW syndrome, Wolf-Parkinson's-White syndrome. So in Wolf-Parkinson's-White syndrome, which is a pre-excitation syndrome, you will have the white QRS complex tachycardia. But remember again, we have one more form of the pre-excitation complex or pre-excitation syndrome that is called LGL syndrome. That is Long Genon Levine syndrome. Long Genon Levine syndrome. So this is the another form of the pre-excitation syndrome. But remember in case of Long Genon Levine syndrome, you will not have the wide QRS complex. You will have the normal QRS complex in case of Long Genon Levine syndrome. So this is one form of classification of the tachycardia based on the QRS complex. Narrow QRS complex and as well as the wide QRS complex. So the answer to this particular question was the pre-excitation syndrome and that too not all the pre-excitation syndromes. It is mainly WPW syndrome which is nothing but your Wolf Parkinson's White syndrome, right? Which is nothing but Wolf Parkinson's White syndrome. Next, followed by that, we have one more very important question. What is the most common sustained arrhythmia? Atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation. The most common sustained arrhythmia is your atrial fibrillation. Now, what do you mean by the word sustained? <clears throat> if the arrhythmia, if it stays, for more than 30 seconds, then we use the word sustained arrhythmia, right? If the arrhythmia, if it is there for more than 30 seconds, then we use the word sustained arrhythmias, right? So what is the most common sustained arrhythmia? It is your atrial fibrillation. Next. Another question is, what is the most common benign rhythm which is identified among the options given to you? Atrial premature contractures, ventricular premature contractures, junctional rhythm, ventricular bijamine. So please remember the most common benign rhythm which is identified is the atrial premature contraction. Right? Atrial premature contraction. See, this is the rhythm with normal heartbeat. And this is the rhythm with the premature atrial contracture. Let me just show you that. You see this? This is your abnormal P wave. So this abnormal P wave, whichever is there, tells you that the impulse is from the atria but not from the SA node. See, the SA nodal P wave will be having the normal morphology. But if you take this entire complex, it is present in between the normal beats with abnormal P wave morphology. So that is what is nothing but your atrial premature contraction. Hmm? That is what is nothing but your atrial premature contraction, right? So this is what is your most common benign rhythm. Then you see another question. What is the most common arrhythmia in COPD patients, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, atrial premature complexes, multifocal atrial tachycardia. The most common arrhythmia in COPD patients is your MAT, that is multifocal atrial tachycardia. That is the most common arrhythmia in COPD patients. Now, what do you understand by this word MAT, that is multifocal atrial tachycardia? I'll just show you that ECG. To call it as MAT, that is multifocal atrial tachycardia, there should be at least three different P wave morphologies within that particular ECG strip, right? There should be at least three different P wave morphologies. So you can just see here, this is one particular morphology of the P wave. This is another morphology of the P wave. And you can see this particular P wave with different morphology. So, in the given ECG strip, there should be a minimum of three different P wave morphologies and the rate should be 
more than 100 per minute. And what about the rhythm? Rhythm will be an irregular rhythm. And rate should be more than 100 but not more than 180. It should be around 100 to 180. Right, it should be around 100 to 180. So this is the criteria for MAT. There should be at least three different P wave morphologies. Rate is around 100 to 180 and the rhythm is the irregular rhythm. Now, what are all the etiology for your MAT? The etiology for your MAT is your COPD, right? That is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. This is one of the most important cause. And the other etiologies include hypoxia, pulmonary hypertension. These are the etiologies for the MAT, that is multifocal atrial tachycardia. Then how do you manage this patient? First and foremost, very important, the oxygen therapy and then you need to treat the underlying condition. Right, then you need to treat the underlying condition and apart from that, rate control Right, apart from that, rate control is another important step in the management of your multifocal atrial tachycardia. So, I will repeat this, multifocal atrial tachycardia means the criteria should be more than 3 different P wave morphologies. The heart rate should be around 100 to 180. The rhythm should be irregular rhythm. And if you take the etiology of MAT, the most common etiology will be your COPD, then hypoxia, pulmonary hypertension then oxygen therapy should be the management and then you need to treat the underlying condition. So this is about your multifocal atrial tachycardia. Then another very important question related to your atrial fibrillation is that post-operative atrial fibrillation is managed with esmolol, digoxin, amidarone, landiolol, hydrochloride. So please remember post-operative atrial fibrillation has to be controlled with an ultra short acting beta 1 selective blocker that is your landiolol. So what is your landiolol now? It is an ultra short acting beta 1 selective antagonist. Right, so that is what is your landular. Okay, now, now in certain clinical scenarios, the atrial fibrillation can get converted into the ventricular fibrillation. Now, what are those conditions? You see here, atrial fibrillation getting converted into ventricular fibrillation is seen with. You see the multiple choice question. Accessory pathway conducting anterogradely like bundle of Kent in WPW syndrome. Second option. Accessory pathway conducting retrogradely like bundle of Kent in WPW syndrome. Third option, accessory pathway conducting anterogradely like bundle of James in Lounganon Levine syndrome. Accessory pathway conducting, ret conducting retrogradely like bundle of James in the Lounganon Levine syndrome. So, atrial fibrillation getting converted into ventricular fibrillation is seen with. Remember, Accessory pathway conducting anti-gradely like bundle of Kent in WPW syndrome. That is the answer for this particular question. Now, in WPW syndrome, the accessory bundle is bundle of Kent. And in LGL syndrome, the accessory pathway is your bundle of James. But remember, it in the, the conversion of atrial fibrillation to ventricular fibrillation will occur mainly in the WPW syndrome, that is Wolf Parkinson's White syndrome. And in Wolf Parkinson's White syndrome, how will be the conduction of the pathway? The accessory pathway conducting anterogradely like bundle of Kent in WPW syndrome. That is how or that is when the atrial fibrillation, it gets converted into the ventricular fibrillation, right? So this is one important question where the atrial fibrillation can get converted into ventricular fibrillation. Now, you take most common form of paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. So, SVTs, how did I classify? AVRT, AVNRT and 
SVT with aberrancy or your atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. So these are all various forms of paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. Now what is the most common form of PSVT? The most common form of PSVT is AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. So AV nodal reentrant tachycardia that is the most common form of paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. So in AV NRT, what is the drug of choice? You need to give first line treatment will be carotid sinus massage. Right, first line treatment will be carotid sinus massage and if the individual is not responding with the carotid sinus massage then you need to give 6 milligrams of adenosine. Right, you need to give 6 milligrams of adenosine. So that is the drug of choice in case of the AVNRT. Anyways, like I will be discussing in detail about the AVRT and as well as the AVNRT as well. Now, coming to the next import, yes. So this is a summary of the basic introduction, whatever we have discussed. Most common arrhythmia mechanism, it is your re-entry. Most common sustained arrhythmia is your atrial fibrillation. Most common benign rhythm identified, atrial premature contracture. Most common arrhythmia in COPD patient, that is multifocal atrial tachycardia. And post-operative atrial fibrillation is managed with short acting beta 1 selective blocker that is landiolol hydrochloride and atrial fibrillation getting converted into ventricular fibrillation is seen with accessory pathway conducting anterogradely like bundle of kentin wpw syndrome and what is the most common form of psvt that is your avnrt that is av nodal reentrant tachycardia so this is the basic introduction of the arrhythmias and after this, in the subsequent sessions, I will be discussing the atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, AVNRT, AVRT, ventricular fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia. So these are all the other topics in Ardhimias which I will be discussing in the subsequent sessions. Thank you very much.